Hello, and thank you for joining us for the sixth annual Global Summit on Kidney Disease and Innovations, Vox Populi. The time is now to prevent and cure kidney diseases. This summit is hosted by the American Association of Kidney Patients in partnership with our allies from the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. My name is Christine Hernandez, and I am a AAKP board member from Illinois in the United States. I am also a in-center hemodialysis patient. I am a registered nurse by profession, and kidney disease has changed my life. Joining the AAKP has empowered me to get knowledge about kidney disease and learn about different treatments and innovations out there. This year's global summit theme, Vox Populi, was purposely and strategically chosen by AAKP for its historic meaning, voice of the people. I am one of the people who has chosen to raise my voice in support of greater care, choice and innovation in kidney care. And I am one of the voices demanding a change in the status quo of kidney medicine. Over 850 million individuals across the world have kidney disease. This number is increasing at an estimated rate of five to 7% annually. Every year, we lose thousands of innocent lives to preventable kidney issues and the lack of timely access to treatment. AAKP believes kidney disease is both a workforce and healthcare issue. The disease takes a devastating toll on human lives and livelihoods. Most people understand that kidney disease left undetected and untreated can lead to premature death. But many are not aware the impact a, a person's dignity and ability to provide for themselves and their families. Kidney disease and outdated treatments can lead to unemployment, underemployment, disability, and dependency. In 2019, AAKP declared the next 10 years the decade of the kidney. The time is now for kidney patients, consumers, and healthcare professionals, researchers, industry, and all people of goodwill to unite our voices and demand change. We are optimistic we can change and will save more lives. But to do this, we must demand new screening guidelines and diagnostic, diagnostics new biologics and new devices. Together we can change, manage, and solve this growing global public health crisis. The time is now for elected and appointed leaders worldwide to listen to patient voices. Governments must remove the regulatory and payment barriers they create that delay innovations and prevent timely care to access. If government fails to act, we will raise our voices and demand the end to negative government determinants of health. Make no mistake, every nation is impacted by kidney disease and millions of people are at risk. The optimistic news is that every person watching this program today can help those impacted by kidney disease and make an impact within their own nation. Throughout, through AAKP Global, AAKP is educating patients, care partners, healthcare professionals, and global policy leaders across the world on unmet patient needs. Our global summit 
on kidney disease and innovations has helped put a face on what is now the 10th leading cause of death based on the data of, from the World Health Organization. We have connected people across the globe in a common purpose larger than any one person or nation. Together, we have increased the hope and optimism. So thank you for joining us. Your voice is the voice of the people and you, you can change and count on AAKP to keep amplifying it throughout the world to create change. What, with that, I am honored to serve as a moderator for our session entitled Utilization of Genetic Testing in Nephrology to Support Early Identification and Intervention of Kidney Diseases, Addressing Patient Privacy Concerns. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Su Kun Lim, a professor of medicine and consultant nephrologist at the University of Malaya Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur. Malaysia, his main interests are chronic kidney disease, pre-dialysis education, glomerular nephritis, and kidney transplantation. Dr. Kim is an active and respected member of the, of the nephrology professional community, serving as vice president of the Malaysian Society of Nephrology. He's, he is also a board member of the National Kidney Foundation, National Renal Registry Advisory Board, and member of the National Credentialing Committee, Specialty Subcommittee of for Nephrology, Dr. Lim has published widely in the nephrology field and has been an invited speaker at numerous international and national congress congresses. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Lim as he shares with us today. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Thanks, AAKP. Uh, thanks to George Washington University for having me in this uh, global summit. So I'm Sukun from Malaysia. My topic today is uh, utilization of genetic testing in nephrology to support early identification and interventions of kidney diseases. This is a simple outline of my lecture. I'm going to cover the clinical utility of genetic tests in nephrology practice from diagnostic to restratification and cover a little bit on pharmacogenomic. So we know that chronic kidney disease is a very heterogeneous condition with many pathophysiological distinct disorder. It encompasses both monogenic and polygenic etiologies. Renal genetic testing using NGS technique from, for clinical purpose in the United States reported a positive genetic findings in 21% over 1,000 cases. However, in many healthcare settings, genetic testing is not routine. Therefore, selection of appropriate patients is important to justify the cost and clinical implications. So this is our general understanding on the genetic and phenotypic variability of kidney diseases. The high genetic heterogeneity of CKD means that in a, a different single gene mutation can yield similar clinical disease subtype, for example, nephrotic syndrome. Even though a common alias typically have a small individual effect size, a certain common alias have a greater impact on disease risk, for example, l one variants in FSGS and non-diabetic CKD. So I'm going to use uh, six clinical scenarios to illustrate the clinical utility of genetic testing. The first case I'm going to show you is this particular gentleman, young patient, 
presented with nephrotic syndrome, renal biopsy reported as a focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, FSGS. He was treated with steroid therapy, but no response. Second immunosuppressant was used, which includes cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin, and mycophenolate morphotil. After 18 months of treatment, he remained nephrotic and kidney function deteriorated. Creatinine was 180 micromole per liter with GFR of 48 mL per minute per 1.73 meter square. A decision was made to repeat the biopsy, which showed FSGS again with chronicity. The interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy was about 30%. So the patient seek second opinion at another hospital. The nephrologist decided to order for a genetic test. As genetic test was not available locally, the test was outsourced to a well-established commercial genetic laboratory based in the United States. And this is fairly common in our local setting. And genetic tests confirm that he has a genetic mutation to porosin MPHS2. After receiving the genetic test report, the immunosuppressants was tapered off and supportive treatment was optimized. So as we understand FSGS genetics, so the common mutations are in nephrine, porosin, CD2AP, and others, and classically characterized by autosomal recessive and onset in childhood. As for adult, the common mutation is in actinin-4, TRPC6, and INF2, which is classically autosomal dominance, and many may not manifest as nephrotic syndrome. So in this particular context, the first clinical utility of a genetic test is in a patient with nephrotic syndrome who is actually resistant to immunosuppressants. So the importance of a genetic test is to avoid unnecessary over immunosuppressants. So the kidney function of the patient deteriorated in view of the persistent nephrosis. EGFR was 18 mL per minute and he was keen for preemptive kidney transplantation the potential kidney donor was his mother, who was blood group compatible. As we know, the recurrence of FSGS after kidney transplantation, the risk is particularly high in somebody with young onset of disease and if the living donor transplantation. However, familiar FSGS with a genetic cause often have low to no risk of disease recurrent post-transplantation. So the second important clinical utility of the genetic test is in somebody with a CKD secondary to FSGS prepared for kidney transplantation. The genetic test can be used to predict the risk of a nephritis recurrence after transplantation. The second case is a young patient, a young lady diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease based on the incidental findings of multiple cysts of varying size over both kidneys from ultrasound kidneys. Her GFR was 70 with a creatinine of 97 micromole per liter. Her 66-year-old mother had multiple cysts over both kidneys on CT scan. However, no kidney failure. As we can see here, her MRI kidney shows multiple small cysts over both kidneys and the size of the kidney was actually maintained, not enlarged. In view of these atypical features, he was actually subjected to a genetic test, which showed that he ha she has a mutation in HNF1B gene. And this is actually not the classical PKD1 or PKD2 genetic mutation. So as we know, based on the current guideline, genetic testing is not a prerequisite for treatment for ADPKD. And the main treatment selection criteria will be based on male classification, and the patient should be re-stratified using a total kidney volume by CT scan or MRI. However, if a patient with ATPKD presented with uh, atypical features, a genetic test should be considered. So the third clinical utility of a genetic test is in a case where a patient who was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease but presented with atypical features, and this is important to avoid misdiagnosis of ADPKD and unnecessary treatment with tovectam. And the indications for genetic tests in PKD include no clear family history, 
appearance and function of the kidneys are not congruent. All patients have atypical appearance of kidney cysts, which can be unilateral, it can be asymmetrical or segmental. Third case is a, this particular man who have end-stage kidney disease, secondary to polycystic kidney disease. The diagnosis was made based on clinical and radiological features. However, he had no family history and he was worked out for kidney transplantation. His potential kidney donor was her, his 45-year-old younger sister, where the CT scan show two simple cysts over right kidney and none over the left kidney. So based on the radiographic diagnostic criteria for ADPKD, at the age of 45, she should have at least two cysts over each kidney to make a diagnosis to, sus to be suspected to have ADPKD. So theoretically, it's very unlikely for her to have ADPKD. However, because she is supposed to be a healthy kidney donor, the kidney test was actually ordered for a re the recipient as well as the donor before the transplantation and it was turned out to be negative, she was able to proceed with the kidney donation and transplantation. So in this particular context, for a potential kidney donor to a family member with possible genetic kidney disease, genetic tests might be important in, clinical, in kidney donor transplant workout. Case four is a lady with a newly diagnosed end-stage kidney disease, secondary diabetic kidney disease, she opted for a continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis and the initial PD regime was 1.5% dialysis for four exchanges. However, she was admitted for two episodes of fluid overload and was suspected due to poor ultrafiltration. The regime was changed to a higher concentration of dialysis and the peritoneal membrane transport status evaluation showed that she was a high transporter. So the clinical question here is, can we predict the peritoneal membrane transport status for patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis? So I want to share with you this particular New England Journal paper, which was published in 2021, titled AQP1, Promoter Variant, Water Transport and Outcome in Peritoneal Dialysis. In this particular paper, the author shared, showed that a common aquaporin AQP1 promoter variant was associated with peritoneal ultrafiltration. And the carrier of the TT genotype of this particular variant, which had presence in about 10 to 16% of the study population from Canada, had poor ultrafiltration. And there was an increased risk of death or technique failure among patients treated with PD who carry this particular genotype after a median follow-up of 2.5 years. So in this particular case, I show to you that it's possible for us to use a genetic test to test for certain genetic variant to, for risk prediction for ultrafiltration failure and increased death risk among patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis. However, uh, another study done in China using the same particular variant was not able to duplicate the same clinical findings. So that basically highlighted to us that more studies need to be done to validate the utility of this particular risk variant in risk prediction. Case number five is this particular man with BMI of 25 and stage kidney disease secondary to IgA nephropathy. He underwent live-related kidney transplantation, had high immunological risk due to previous blood transfusion, and he was started off Evergraph, which is tacrolimus at six milligram daily, which is one milligram per kilo per day, five days before transplantation, which is fairly common in our local setting. The tacrolimus level was checked one day before transplantation. It was low at four nanogram per mil. The Evergraph dose was increased to eight milligram and the levels were rejected again three days later, showing 6.2 nanogram per mil and the Evergraph dose was adjusted again to reach the therapeutic level of 8 to 10 nanogram per mil. And this is actually fairly common in the practice of transplantation. So the clinical question is, can we do better in tacrolimus dosing? So I want to share with you another paper published in 2022 to illustrate to how to apply the knowledge in pharmacogenomic in terms of tacrolimus dosing. So in this particular study, 
82 kidney transplant recipients were non-randomly assigned to a genotype adapted or body weight based tacrolimus dosing regime. And it showed that the proportion of subjects who achieved the te target tacrolimus level on the day four and day 10 post operation was significantly higher in the adapted group, which was about 53% versus 24% on day four and 47% versus 17% at day 10. As it's also interesting to show that the proportion of subject with sub-therapeutic tacrolimus exposure on day four was significantly higher in the control group, which was about 56% versus 10% in the adapted group. And this is particularly important for those who carry the CYP3A511 genotype, who is actually a rapid metabolizer. And if we identify this patient early before transplantation, they should be given a higher dose of tacrolimus from the beginning. And another case is uh, this particular man who has stage 3 CKD patients, secondary to hypertension. Other comorbidities include a hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease with previous stenting. His medication include a copidogrel and antiplatelet therapy, three antihypertensive and one statin. And he was admitted for stroke with right hemiparesis, a CT brain confirmed an ischemic stroke. The clinical question is, when somebody is already on antiplatelet therapy and still emitting for a stroke or vascular event, our question is often whether this patient is adherent to the treatment or whether the risk factor control is actually not good enough. But I just want to point out to you that in the current era, the next issue that we need to think about is in terms of pharmacogenomic. Because as we understand, copidogrel is a prodrug, is inactive, you need this enzyme metabolism, which is a CYP2C19, to convert it to uh, active metabolites. We have a more potent antiplatelet activities. And patients with a decrease in the CYP2C19 activity has less active metabolite formation, thus less antiplatelet activities. And multiple large observational studies show that those people with intermediate or poor metabolizer of this particular enzyme who receives copidogrel have significantly worse cardiovascular outcome. If they are detected, they should be offered an alternative antiplatelet agent instead of copidogrel. So the sixth clinical utility that I want to show to you that is in the current era, we should be able to apply a pharmacogenomic information in order to guide us in terms of drug choice or in terms of drug dosing. So ladies and gentlemen, the take home messages from me is, we are very close to the implement, implementation of genetic testing in the clinical practice, but more studies need to be done. And in this particular talk, I have demonstrated to you the important utility of nephrology care, which cover from diagnostic to re-stratification to drug management, as well as transplant workout. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take any question. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for your excellent presentation. Before we move on to the next speaker, I do have a few questions I'd like to ask you. Dr. Lim, the theme of the Global Summit this year is Vox Populi, because AAKP believes patients are demanding greater innovation in kidney care and treatment. Can you tell us how you are using genetic testing to improve interventions for patients with kidney disease? As I explained in the lecture just now, uh, we can actually use a genetic tests in nephrology practice, particularly in the area of uh, improved diagnosis, restratification, in terms of medication management, and even in the area of a kidney transplant workout. So these are the four areas I actually focus on in my practice now in terms of a utilization of genetic testing. Could you discuss the specific genetic markers that your research has targeted that are commonly linked to kidney disease and how accurate they are in predicting when kidney disease might start? 
in Malaysia, uh, it's actually not common for us to actually do genetic test research. But currently, uh, my area of interest is actually uh, one of the cases that I show you is in the case of uh, patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis and how to use uh, the testing on a certain genetic variant to predict the risk of the technique failure, ultra filtration failure. And one of the gene uh, variant that we are working on is the AK1 promoter gene that I actually highlighted in the lecture. And I, this is because in the candidate study, it shows that the predictive power is strong, but when it was actually done in another country, which is China, it, they are not able to duplicate the same findings. So it would be interesting to actually for me to show that in our local setting, Malaysia, which is a multiracial country, whether we are able to use this particular genetic variant to actually predict the risk of ultra filtration failure, as well as death risk among our patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis. And this is one of the areas that I'm actually working on now. How do you think genetic testing will affect the prevalence and treatment of kidney disease worldwide in the long run? So if you look at a lot of uh, biopsy registry, we can find that there are a group of patients who are actually put as unknown in terms of their cause of the kidney disease. And I believe part of the, the reason is because um, we are lacking of a certain testing, particularly genetic tests to actually verify the cause. So I strongly believe with the more widespread of the genetic testing, we'll be able to make a diagnosis for most of the kidney disease and that definitely will help us to clarify in terms of the underlying cause and guide us in terms of the treatment. And the other important value of genetic testing in kidney disease is also to avoid unnecessary uh, over immunosuppressants because it's, very, uh, it's not uncommon for us to use immunosuppressants to treat certain kidney diseases, particularly glomerulonephritis. But if we know that this particular patient have a genetic cause of the disease, then we might be able to avoid over immunosuppressants. I think this is an important value of genetic tests. Finally, Dr. Lim, can you share with us if there are any policy changes in Malaysia regarding the use of genetic testing in kidney disease and how are patient concerns regarding the privacy being addressed? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for the meantime, uh, there is no obvious uh, policy change uh, in this particular context for Malaysia setting. But I presume uh, us as a clinician and researcher, we are the ones should be driving for the policy change. We have to show to the policymaker the importance, uh, clinical implication of the implementing uh, genetic testing in certain clinical diseases. Of course, in our local setting, many patients are very concerned in their insurance coverage. They are worried that once they are diagnosed to have a genetic cause of the disease, then the insurance might actually not covering them uh, for their following treatment. So that is actually one of the barrier in terms of us ordering genetic uh, tests for some of our patients. Dr. Lim, thank you for your insightful presentation on the utilization of genetic testing in nephrology to support early identification and interventions of kidney diseases. Your expertise and knowledge on the topic were enlightening and greatly appreciated.